as well, which is apropos for today's book. And my hands are a bit worse for the wear today, but I had a wonderful comment from one of the study patrons that said they liked it when YouTube showed their real self. They weren't trying to make their appearance perfect. And I really appreciated that comment because a lot of times I'm a bit worried about what my hands look like or what I look like. And I don't think we should worry about that. We should just... Uh, Enjoy the sounds, think about the subject matter, and just perpetuate some positive energy in the world. But it did make me think about how everyone's constantly being influenced by social media, and it can make people feel rather inadequate or you're not perfect. So if you're a perfectionist, it's doubly risky. So it's nice to hear that uh, we're just going to be ourselves and just appreciate each other for our, our own nature and hopefully the rest of the world for its nature which we'll do now without further ado or any ado about nothing so I've got a cup of tea with um, our favourite kingfisher and we've got what looks like a book engraving here of a tree with the boughs and branches arms in the bowl. You'll notice some archaic English spelling there. Words were shortened between that time and now in modern English usage, or shall I say much more modern English usage, for various reasons. And here you can see the fruit, which is a um, very pretty gold leaf. It's shiny. The quest for Shakespeare's garden. This beautiful forest green front pieces and a labyrinth there. I would love to have something like that in a big garden to walk around in peace and quiet and contemplate. Garden labyrinths are so much fun. Have you been to one? So we'll have lots of beautiful pictures in this book. There's Will himself, Mr. Shakespeare, and all of the beautiful flowers, Rose, Viola, Iris, look at that, and Lilies, Delphinum. This book is full of wonderful quotes as well. I know a bank where the wild time blows. Now if you know that one, do you remember? Midsummer Night's Dream and all the fairies. And this is illustrations from the collections of the Shakespeare birthplace. Dense. 
Shakespeare and the world of nature. Shakespeare and the Victorian language of flowers. Shakespeare the gardener. Shakespeare and garden history. The quest for the past. The Elizabethan garden rediscovered. The new place garden and its creation. Shakespeare Gardens around the globe, as well as an introduction to Francis Bacon's Essay of Gardens, Miss lots of photographs of beautiful fabrics, as well the Elizabethans being in the Renaissance era. Shakespeare, birthplace trust. William Shakespeare has long been associated with nature, and his plays and poems are full of references to the flowers, herbs, and trees that he knew and saw in the world around him. Today, visitors to the five family homes associated with Shakespeare in Stratford upon Avon. Experience five very different gardens, living, breathing spaces that afford us a very real link to Shakespeare's works and his world. Although Shakespeare's final home, New Place, is no longer standing, records show that there has been a garden on the site of New Place in some form for over 400 years. Fittingly, while we were preparing this book, the Trust's garden team was laying out a new garden, a new place, to commemorate the 400th anniversary of Shakespeare's death. Establish this beautiful garden. And here's another quote from Love's Labour's Lost. It standeth north, northeast, and it by east from the mist corner of thy curious knotted garden. What kind of a direction would that be? North, northeast. And by east, from the west corner. <laughs> that almost looks... What kind of a thing is that? It's a page from John Gerard's The Herbal 1633 edition. Looks like miniature bananas, but I don't think it is. And here we have Shakespeare's Garden, Stratford upon Avon by Ernest Long, C.B., one of the trustees, with illustrations, 1922. There you can see what a knotted garden looks like, with all the little box hedges sewn in, well, patterns, so that it looks like if you pulled it, it would make a knot. Therewith fantastic garlands did she make, of crow flowers, nettles, daisies, and long purples. Queen Gertrude from Hamlet, 
this is the actress Jane Lessingham playing Ophelia in a production of Hamlet at the Covent Garden Theatre in 1772. Her flower-strewn dress and loose flowing hair illustrate distraught Ophelia's words. There's room for you. and cornflowers, and these look to be from that same herbal book. And here, Perdita, from the winter's tale, gives flowers. Here's flowers for you. Hot lavender, mints, savory, marjoram, the marigold. The flowers of the midsummer. And this is after a painting by F. Wheatley. And here are some gilly flowers. They look like dianthus, possibly, or pinks, carnations. This one is an illustration from the introduction to Henry Ellicombe's The Plant Love and Garden Craft of Shakespeare, 1896 edition. See the knotted garden there. And the patterns laid out. That's for thoughts. So nothing about eating. That was a joke. <laughs> and here, Mistress Quickly and the Merry Wives of Windsor. Look at that gorgeous, gorgeous fabric. In emerald tufts, flowers, purple, blue and white like sapphire, pearl, and rich embroidery, buckled below fair knighthood's bending knee. The fairies use flowers for their character. And this says this is um, a detail from the embroidered silk pillow depicting tulips and roses and irises there. So these must be the roses, and these the tulips, and there's the iris. It's from the 17th century or the 1600s. This one is a bodice of, of fine linen. Early 17th century. Another one this looks like glove, doesn't it? Finely embroidered cuff of a man's kid glove. Early 17th century. Look at the flowers on that. And the gold thread, the green leaves, and the blue and the green. And the trefoil. And quatrefoil. Look at that. Almost reminds me an orchard scene from Much Ado About Nothing, where Hero, Rosala, and Beatrice are discussing the problem with the men. Whisper her ear and tell her I and Rosala walk in the orchard, and our whole discourse is of her. 
say that thou overbearedst us, and bid her steal into the bleached tower, where honeysuckles ripened by the sun, forbid the sun to enter. And from Midsummer Night's Dream, Oberon, a little western flower, before milk white, now purple with love's wound, and made in scarlet, love in idleness, the one that gave the magic potion, the love potion. And here we have Perdita again, from Winter's Tale. Oh, Proserpina, for the flowers now that frighted thou let's to fall from Dis's wagon, daffodils that come before the swallow dares and take the winds of March with beauty, violets dim but sweeter than the lids of Juno's eyes, or Cythereus breath Wife's Garden, 1648 edition. And this one is the introductory page from the first folio of Shakespeare's works in 1623. It's quite funny to the great variety of readers, from the most able to him that can but spell. There you are numbered. We had rather you were weighed, especially when the fate of all books depends upon your capacities, and not your heads alone, but of your purses. Well, it is now public, and you will stand to your privileges we know to read and censure. Do so, but buy it first. That doth best command a book. The stationer says, Then, how odd soever your brains be, or your wifedoms, make your license the same, and spare not, judge your sixpence worth, your shillings worth, your five shillings worth at a time or higher. So you rise to the just rates, and welcome. Is another ornament from the gardener's labyrinth in 1577. And we know this gentleman, David Garrick. Do you remember the famous actor, Drury Lane Theatre, and this one by Robert Edgepine in 1770? 
Shakespeare became this idol of the budding romantics and the romanticist movement, this immortal part. In this new ideological context, Shakespeare's ascent to divinity may seem inevitable, but it was to a very large extent owed to one man, the actor. David Garrick. He deliberately set out to cast himself in duality with the poet and in 1769 staged a three-day jubilee in his honour at Stratford-upon-Avon. The climax was Garrick unveiling a statue of the bard, which he presented to the town and in front of which he declaimed his own verses eulogizing that demigod who Avon's flowery margin trod while sportive fancy round him flew where nature led him by the hand instructed him in all she knew and gave him absolute command This says this Robert H. Pine oil is a copy of a lost Gainsborough portrait that was destroyed by fire in 1946, possibly to do with the war. Here we have the baby Shakespeare and all the muses. Sorrow. Henry the Sixth, prick not your finger as you pluck it off, lest bleeding you do paint the white rose red. Sounds like Lewis Carroll. And here, the bust of Shakespeare, encircled by all the flowers mentioned in his works getting into the Victorians and the Romantic era. And, of course, the Neo-Gothic, which people like to disparage, but at the same time we can see what the draw was for looking back, looking at humanities or Europe's history and going into the world of the imaginary having a very deep and active imagination because there had been some wars, the Napoleonic Wars lots of civil reform had torn countries apart and the industrial age was changing not only the landscape but the way people moved about, the way they made their livelihoods and culture itself. So we can see it was a time of great imagination but also enthusiasm for learning finding old things. So a lot of the medieval texts that we have, their discovery we owe to these curious Victorians, even if their evaluations of them might have been somewhat slanted and stilted. And here we have the flower fairies flowers from Shakespeare's garden, 1909. Look at all the beautiful illustrations and very detail. The 
this one's gorgeous. I love this creature. It's very arts and crafty, sort of neo-gothic, going back to Renaissance and medieval bucolic sorts of ideas, finding that in Shakespeare's works. This is from Grimson's Shakespeare's Flora, 1883. Plant law and garden craft of Shakespeare. A 1633 edition, again from John Gerard's The Herbal. These printed plates have been colored in, so it must have been a very valuable book. And this one, Oberon from Midsummer Night's Dream. I know a bank where the wild thyme blows. Slips and the nodding violet grows quite over canopied with luscious woodbine, with sweet musk roses, and with eglantine. The fountain has gone off for the evening. still twittering outside, for the sun will be very late going down tonight as we approach midsummer. Who, when he lived, his breath in beauty set gloss on the rose, smelled the violet, Venus and Adonis. of the garden at New Place. One from Measure for Measure. He hath the garden circumured with brick, whose western side is with a vineyard backed, and to that vineyard is a blanket gate that makes his opening with this bigger key, this other doth command a little door, which from the vineyard to the garden leads. Look at that gorgeous Elizabethan garden. You can see the patterns of the box edge and the types of flowers. Recognize them today, can't you? Look at that. And the caryatids as well. Beautiful garden to inspire beautiful poetry. Merchant of Venice is Lorenzo. How sweet the moonlight sleeps upon this bank. Here we will sit and let the sounds of music creep in our ears. Soft stillness and the night become touches of sweet harmony. There's the carnation again. Venus and Adonis, flowers are sweet, their colors fresh and trim. The form and shape of a bill bouquet, which is an instrument to take the measure of rounds, as we have declared before. So, in order to make these even, We've got a measuring stick. And this is the first English book to publish. 
published garden designs in a geometric style found in Italian Renaissance gardens was hints on the formation of garden and pleasure grounds in 1812 by John Claudius Lauder. once again, the moon shines bright in such a night as this, when the sweet wind did gently kiss the trees, and they made no noise. This one is Susanna and the Elders, an allegory on the transience of life. shows behind it these garden tunnel with little windows and the people are going in to walk amongst it and you can see the renaissance style architecture there that one and of course the roman arches not quite sure what that is from Walter Crane's Flowers from Shakespeare's Garden, 1909. Look at that. It's very Art Nouveau, isn't it? We get all of the movements from Renaissance to Enlightenment and Romanticism and Art Nouveau. And here we have the roses. Look at that. William Lawson's A New Orchard and Garden. The best way for planting, grafting, and to make any ground good for a rich orchard, all grounded on the principles of art and the precepts of experience, being the labors of 48 years of William Lawson's 1648 edition. set out your garden and the directions. There we have a rose, a white rose, rosemary, herb, and a daffodil on the bulb. I no more desire a rose than wish a snow in May's new fangled shows, but like of each thing that in season grows. So no hothouse flowers for him. And this is from Thomas Hill's Gardener's Labyrinth, 1577. about nothing under the honey. 
after gardening. That's a lovely, lovely sight. I like that. And creating new place. A new place in Stratford upon Avon. March 1861. There's some old photographs. Shakespeare's birthplace is a different house. You can read a little bit about New Place. It was purchased by Shakespeare in 1597 and was one of the most substantial properties in Stratford-upon-Avon. Indeed, the second largest in the town. Contemporary records refer to a great garden, but nothing is known about it, however. The area in which it was situated was large enough to accommodate two barns and an orchard. Shakespeare purchased the property from William Underhill II, who died in 1597. At the close of the 15th century, the house had belonged to the Copton family, passing in 1563 to William Bott, who in turn sold it. In 1567, to William Underhill I, a successful lawyer. Placed into that context, the playwright would have purchased something that already had a garden to some form. After the playwright's death, the property passed to his daughter, Susanna Hall and then his granddaughter Elizabeth. On her death, the house passed back to the Clapton family again, who in 1702 altered or rebuilt it. And then of course there's a long history about New Place. This is the Bowling Green at New Place Garden. 1844. So we can see the garden had taken up before a very large area, before it became this bowling green. And here's Ernest Law's border at New Place Garden in the 1920s. We still have these topiaries there. is Hill's Garden Labyrinth in 1577. And here we have the Illustrated London News. Um, it's artist's impression of restored new place, not garden, with Elizabethan characters at work, or what they might have looked like to someone in 1922. Illustration from that. Another one from Richard the Second. Oh, what a pity if it that he had not so trimmed and dressed his land as we this garden. So you can see that gardens were very important to the Elizabethan. spoken about in Shakespeare and mentioned and there's wild thyme there wild rosemary and a mulberry and that 
same illustration from before with the peacocks. I don't know why, but peacocks being in the picture of a garden always lends some elegance to it, just elevates it a bit. But they're such lazy birds. And here we have crab apples, a wild pine tree. Two wild pines. Shakespeare Garden in New York. And here's the Huntington Shakespeare Garden in California. Features flowers that were cultivated in England during Shakespeare's time. And a few pages from Francis Bacon's Of Gardens, 1680 edition. Republished it here. A double African marigold. Wild strawberry. That we can find everywhere. An iris or a stinking gladden. Upright, heartsease or violet. And purple garden violet. a pear tree, English cherry, and baker's ditch apple. Doesn't sound very nice. And our last one, the province or damask rose. The rose looks fair, but fairer we it deem, for that sweet odour which doth in it live. From sonnet so my friend, I hope you are nice and relaxed and floating off to sleep through all the herbs and flowers of the Elizabethan garden in Shakespeare's time. Be good to yourself to others.